6 p.m. here in Korea. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let us begin with the headlines. Prosecutors question two figures with ties to the scandal around a confidant of President Park Geun-hye. The presidential office drops everything to focus on its response as the public's anger and distrust builds. The strongest UN resolution to date on North Korea's human rights abuses is submitted for review. If passed, it could be approved as early as next month. Discouraging digits in terms of business sentiment for Korea, which hit a three-month low at 99.8. Manufacturing firms race for the impact as a prolonged slump in demand is expected. The starting point of our coverage is the expanding probe into the power abuse scandal with President Park Geun-hye's close aide Choi Soon Sil at the center. Two key figures, one of them who has been close to Choi for over 10 years, are in the hot seat even as we speak. Hwang Woo Jun has our top story. Prosecutors summoned Lee Seung Chol on Friday morning as a witness in the growing scandal centering around President Park Geun-hye's longtime confidant Choi Soon Sil. E, the current vice president of the Federation of Korean Industries, helped establish two foundations linked to Che, and participated in fundraising for the organizations. Che is suspected of having used her connections to President Park to solicit a massive amount of corporate donations for the foundations in a short period of time, and is also accused of having embezzled some of the funds. Prosecutors are also questioning Ko Young Tae, a man known to have close ties to Che. During an interview last week with local broadcaster JTBC, Ko indicated that Che had access to the president's speeches, raising questions about whether she also had access to sensitive state documents. In the interview, Ko was quoted as saying that what Che loves most is editing the president's speeches. Ko was immediately taken for questioning upon his arrival in Seoul late Thursday after flying in from Bangkok. The prosecution says Ko flew back of his own free will and is being quizzed as a witness, not a suspect, based on his request. Ko is a former top-class fencer and the CEO of a handbag company. Meanwhile, the Ministry of Justice is seeking a way to bring Che back to Korea from Germany. A ministry official said Friday that it is doing all it can, including exploring the option of suspending her passport. However, that's easier said than done. In order for an extradition request to be granted, a trial must be held on the allegations against the subject. Moreover, Che's exact whereabouts in Germany are still unclear. Hwang Woo Jun, Arirang News. Meanwhile, President Park Geun-hye is deliberating on her next steps following this week's public apology for giving her confidant access to major speeches. A presidential office official told reporters the key priority at the moment is easing public anxiety stemming from the scandal and administrating state affairs with a steady hand amid to large-scale reshuffle of the cabinet and or the president's senior secretaries as demanded by the National Assembly is widely expected in the coming days. With the case still developing, the president's approval ratings have hit a record low. According to a weekly poll released Friday by Gallup Korea, the figure stands at 17 percent, but it took a nosedive to 14 percent between Wednesday and Thursday right after her public apology. Parliament has once again fallen into a standstill with the rival parties pursuing different approaches to an independent counsel investigation for the Choi Soon Shield case. Park Ji Won has the latest from the National Assembly. Korea's political parties have failed to reach agreement on how to proceed with an independent investigation into the Choi Soon Shield scandal as they are all advocating for different approaches. The ruling Senate Party wants to use a special prosecution system established in 2014, which it says will result in a swift investigation. The main opposition Democratic Party of Korea has rejected that idea, arguing that under the system, the president appoints the independent counsel and the investigation period is only 90 days at maximum. Instead, it wants an independent counsel investigation governed by a separate law. The party also said it won't take part in bipartisan negotiations unless three conditions are met. First, the Senuri party should offer a sincere apology to the public. Second, senior presidential secretary Woo byung should resign. Third, all of the key government officials involved in the Choi case should resign. 
In response, Senate Party floor leader Chang Jin Suk said the conditions have already been met. He also said that if the presidential office refuses to undertake a reshuffle, the ruling party leadership will resign. We already asked those responsible to resign, told the public that we're sorry, and also accepted the call for an independent counsel. What do we miss? In addition, Senate Party leader Lee jung hyun told reporters on Friday that he had met with President Park earlier in the day and called for Choi's immediate repatriation and a swift reshuffle of cabinet members and presidential officials. Meanwhile, the minor opposition People's Party says it's not the time for an additional investigation into the case, but if there had to be one, then it would advocate for an independent counsel appointed by the opposition bloc. It also reiterated its call for the president to come clean on the allegations. We appeal to President Park and Choi soon shil The only way now is a complete confession. The president who knows the whole truth should reveal it to the people and dismiss the key presidential secretaries and other responsible officials. Amid the standoff, National Assembly Speaker Chung se gyun and the floor leaders of the three main parties are slated to meet on Monday to discuss the matter further. Park ji Arirang News. Let's sidestep from the Choi Soon-sil scandal for now. A draft resolution on North Korea's human rights abuse has been submitted to the UN General Assembly for review. If approved, this would be the 12th such resolution adopted by the global organization. But according to Arkani Kim, this one is different. It includes significant changes from the previous resolutions. The strongest UN resolution on North Korea's human rights abuses has been presented to a committee at the UN General Assembly for review. A South Korean government official said Friday that the draft resolution is being circulated among members of the General Assembly's third committee, which deals with humanitarian issues. It'll be put to vote by the committee next month, after which it would be adopted at the UN General Assembly in December. The UN has previously adopted resolutions on the issue every year since 2005, but this year's draft resolution contains some of the strongest language yet. It says that human rights violations in North Korea are being perpetrated by institutions under the effective control of North Korea's leadership. It also includes a call to refer the issue and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity. This year's resolution for the first time expresses concern over North Korean workers reportedly forced into labor overseas. It also mentions the impact of Pyongyang's decision to divert resources to its nuclear weapons program on the human rights situation in the North. The North's abysmal human rights record has come to the fore this year, especially with the U.S. imposing sanctions on leader Kim Jong-un for human rights violations for the first time and South Korea's law on the North's human rights going into effect in September. North Korea has characterized the efforts as a U.S.-led attempt to topple the regime. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The White House has reiterated the United States is firmly committed to its denuclearization policy on North Korea. The clarification came after Washington's top intelligence officials suggested there were differences of opinion on that matter. For details, let's turn to our Kwan Soa. The U.S. government has reiterated that the denuclearization of North Korea remains its key policy goal in dealing with the country. White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest was responding to remarks made this week by James Clapper, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, who said Washington should put a cap on the regime's nuclear capabilities and not try to denuclearize it. Ernest said Clapper seemed to be saying the current strategy would not likely prompt Pyongyang to give up its nuclear program before President Obama leaves office. He reaffirmed that in the long term, the U.S. will continue to work with the world to get North Korea to comply with its international obligations by adding pressure on the regime, including U.N. Security Council resolutions. This is seen as supporting an earlier State Department claim that denuclearization remains the U.S. goal with North Korea. A high-ranking South Korean official who spoke on condition of anonymity with South Korean correspondents in Washington Thursday gave his opinion, saying Clapper's remarks are quite different from the Obama administration's stance. On the recent informal talks between a North Korean delegation and former U.S. government officials in Malaysia, the official said the meeting suggests North Korea is not ready for sincere dialogue and sanctions are what's needed to put effective pressure on Pyongyang.
This, he said, as North Korea has only proven its stubborn claim that its nuclear program is needed for deterrence. Hwan so Arirang News. Korea's defense chief attempted to deflect concerns about Seoul's plan to work out a system to share military intel with Tokyo. He countered skeptics by saying the deal is needed to better counter North Korea's increasing threats. Kim Hyun bin shares with us the minister's remarks. South Korean Defense Minister Han min gu says that South Korea and Japan have resumed talks on a bilateral military intelligence sharing agreement in order to enhance security cooperation against North Korea's ever-growing nuclear and missile threats. During a meeting at the National Assembly on Friday, Han reminded lawmakers that Seoul has signed 32 intelligence sharing pacts with other countries and emphasized that the proposed deal has nothing to do with the U.S. missile defense in the region. He also reiterated that the military has been asking for the agreement with Japan since 1989. Under the prospective agreement, the two allies will be able to share intelligence on North Korea's nuclear and missile program without having to receive it from the U.S. under the current trilateral information sharing agreement. Formal negotiations on the bilateral agreement began in 2012 but came to a halt due to protests from the Korean public. Many Koreans are against the agreement because of the history of Japan's colonial rule of Korea from 1910 to 1945 and lingering historical and territorial disputes. Some also worried that the pact will allow Japan's self-defense forces to fight on the peninsula in times of crisis without Seoul's consent. The defense ministry said, however, that National Assembly approval will be required for such a deployment. Japan has five intelligence satellites, six Aegis destroyers, four ground radar systems, and other state-of-the-art surveillance equipment. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. The prospects for South Korea's economy still looks fairly gloomy. Many fear the drop in demand could continue hurting local firms. Shin Se-min looks beyond the numbers. Businesses in Korea are still uneasy about the state of the local economy. According to the Federation of Korean Industries, overall business sentiment for next month has fallen to a three-month low. The figure stands at 89.8 for November, down over six points from this month. A figure under 100 means pessimism prevails. That sharp decline comes as an increasing number of local firms expect the slump in demand to continue both at home and abroad. Sentiment was also affected by a prolonged strike by unionized workers on the nation's railroads and a slowdown by unionized cargo truckers. The gloom is registering strongly in the manufacturing sector. In a recent similar survey by the Bank of Korea, the Business Survey Index for Manufacturing Firms stood at 71 for October, unchanged for a third straight month. Their outlook for the month to come registered at 72, down three points from a month earlier. But some sectors saw a rise in sentiment, including electrical equipment firms and automakers whose employees have ended their walkout. With the government set to announce new measures next Monday for the ongoing government-led corporate restructuring of the shipbuilding industries, eyes are on whether the country's manufacturing sector, which has been the backbone of the economy, will gain new hope. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The Korean government has vowed to invest about $1.4 billion over the next decade to develop technologies deemed vital for the fourth industrial revolution. According to Finance Minister Yu Iro, who spoke at an international conference in Seoul on Friday, nine core sectors, including artificial intelligence and virtual and augmented reality, have been des designated as national strategic projects to nurture and develop. Tax benefits will also be given to 11 promising fields like robot technology and future cars to attract more private investment. The top economic policymaker also promised to make software training mandatory for elementary and middle school students and increase the number of universities that specialize in the fields. An African delegation was in Korea recently for a series of events aimed at boosting ties. One standout figure is the president of the African Development Bank. Ar Kim Min-ji sat down with Akinwumi Adesia to hear the insights on the economic cooperation between Korea and Africa. The African continent, known for its abundant natural resources, has been dubbed the world's last blue ocean. President Park Geun-hye visited three countries in Africa earlier in the year and also highlighted the potential of the region. 
In fact, Korea's investment in the African continent has grown over fivefold since 2006, while ODA support has jumped sevenfold. Over the years, Korea has also been sharing its own development experiences with Africa. You take a look at a country that used to be so poor, per capita uh, income at that time was just about $167 per person. And today you move that to a country where the per capita income now is well over $27,000, almost $30,000. That is incredible. And I think the lessons there, you know, in terms of what you do with Samuel Undong, you know, in terms of agricultural transformation, how what you did in terms of industrial development, those are the things that I believe that uh, Korea is sharing with Africa. That President Akinwumi Adesina was part of an African delegation from 41 countries and regional institutions recently in Korea for the Korea-Africa Economic Cooperation Meeting. The ministerial meeting was launched 10 years ago to share Korea's development experience and boost cooperation in resource development. Among the achievements at this year's meeting, Korea decided to carry out projects worth 5 billion U.S. dollars in Africa over the next two years. Access to electricity is going to be critical if you're going to industrialize. But so is in investment in roads and rail and ports that allows you to be able to get your uh, manufactured goods and services uh, much faster uh, to, uh, to the market. Are there any areas of expertise that Korea in particular can um, give to Africa on either the government or a private level? What Korea did in terms of investing in research and development, in innovations and human capital development, I think those are going to be very significant areas of how Africa can build better institutions of training and also skills in things like engineering, uh, computer sciences. This will prepare the young people in Africa for the jobs of tomorrow. The president says he sees Korea as a key partner in the continent's road to industrialization, adding that there's further potential for Korea and Africa to build on their existing alliances and partnerships. Kim Min-ji, Arirang News. That's all from me at this hour. If you're tuning in from Korea, do stick around for more domestic headliners next. Thank you for watching. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Devin Whiting with more of your domestic news. Today marks one month since Korea implemented a law meant to clamp down on corruption. When the anti-graft law went into effect, there were concerns that the strictness of the law would cause confusion and hurt businesses involved in leisure activities like golf or those selling high-end products like flowers. So what effect has it actually had so far? Our Kim hye takes a closer look. It's a move toward a cleaner, more transparent society. The Improper Solicitation and Graft Act, the country's most extensive anti-corruption measure to date that aims to curb corruption by imposing spending limits on gifts and meals given to Korean public officials, journalists and teachers, went into effect on September 28th. It's been a month since the law went into effect. How has it affected the economy, culture and the way people interact with one another? Han Jong-hoon, a corporate employee, signed up for a table tennis club near his house earlier this month. Since the anti-graph law has passed, our team has fewer client dinners and nights out, which means more free time for me. I like exercising, so after work, I come here twice a week to play ping pong with my wife and two boys. Like Han, more Koreans have reported getting extra free time after work and are using it for hobbies. That's evidenced by a double-digit increase in sales of sporting goods like tennis and table tennis gear, as well as swimming suits, between September 28th and October 23rd. But sales of equipment and accessories for golf, a relatively more expensive sport in the country, have dropped by 15 percent compared to the same period last year. Expensive restaurants and the leisure industry have been hit hard as people spend less money. But that loss has been recovered somewhat due to an uptick in other service industries and retailers. In the long run, the anti-graft law is expected to clean up the country and bring more growth. Korea ranks 27th among OECD countries on Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index with a score of 56 out of 100. 
And according to a survey by Korea's Anti-Corruption and Civil Rights Commission last year, six out of ten Koreans think their society is corrupt and unfair. Some say that regulating gift-giving, like giving flowers to teachers, is a bit too harsh and the law could cause inconvenience. But we are in a transition period to help clean up corruption in our society, large and small. We need to follow the anti-graft law until it takes root. One month is still a short amount of time to gauge a law's effect. But the anti-graft law has set a precedent for Koreans to be more mindful about gift-giving and treating others and the influence such details can have. Kim Hye-sung, Arirang News. Now, households paying for city gas services can expect their bills to rise next month. The government will raise rates for city gas by 6.1 percent starting November 1st to keep local rates in line with international gas prices, which have risen in recent months. According to the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy, that means about 16.5 million households will see their monthly gas bills rise by an average of about 1,761, or about one U.S. dollar and 50 cents. Most households currently pay about 34,000 won a month, or about 30 U.S. dollars. It's the first rate increase in 14 months and comes as crude oil prices have risen by 25 percent from $36 a barrel to $45 a barrel. Korea is steadily becoming a regional destination for overseas study. Last month, according to the Ministry of Justice, the number of foreign students in the country surpassed the 120,000 mark for the first time. That's a rise of almost 20 percent from a year earlier. Most of the students, 58 percent of them, were from China, followed by those from Vietnam at about 11 percent and Mongolia at just under 5 percent. As a sign of the globalization of the Korean language, fully 30 percent of them had a visa specifically for studying Korean. <laughs> Meanwhile, the total number of foreigners in Korea as of last month, student or otherwise, stood at about 2,030,000, a rise of 2.3 percent from the previous month. And those are some of the stories we're following right now. Thanks for watching. We'll be back at 8 p.m. Korea time. Bye for now.